the last 30 years have seen a huge increase in the popularity of game shooting. And with it, there's also been an increase in the number of pheasants and partridges released into the British countryside every year. This is a double-edged sword because on one side, game shooting has never been more accessible. The working man and woman, we can go out and enjoy pheasant shooting like we never could have 50 years ago. However, the opposition have also got hold of the quantities of pheasants that are being released and have asked DEFRA to review the practice and perhaps impose regulation. And this petition really got me thinking, is there any merit in that? But before we get started, I spoke to Ant McLernan, a local gamekeeper, about how pheasant release works. So how does pheasant release actually work, Ant? So at this place, mate, we buy them in at seven week old when they're old enough to survive in the wild, bring them in and we put them into these pens, which are, as you can see, they're secure from predation from the outside, but the birds have free movement within and out of that pen, you know I mean? I, I'm not as tall as you might, but I can put my hand over the top of that. Bird has wings, it can fly quite well at seven week old. We try and encourage them to stay in there by making the food source and water source and safety the main thing inside that pen. Just while they become streetwise, so they become able to learn how to sleep in the trees on a night time, go in a roost, which is what we want, and we want them to know that this is home. Then. As they get older, they more frequently get out the pen and go further away and start learning their way around the estate and learning where things are. But they hopefully know that this is a safe place that is home. So these birds become wild very quickly? Probably for the first three weeks, there will be a lot of birds in that pen. And by the time the first three weeks have gone, those birds are now flying off a roost out the top of that oak tree, which is considerably higher than the pen wire, they're landing out there and they have free roam of the estate. They can go wherever they please. And gradually they become more and more wild until they become the wild bird that you see about now. They are completely wild now, in my eyes. They are my birds, but they are wild and I just manage them. Unfortunately, there's a small but very vocal minority of people who disagree with the practice Ant took us through. They state that the release of game birds damages native reptiles, plants and invertebrates, to the point that actually it degrades wildlife. They also state that game birds can carry disease, ticks, and that there's some welfare issues with the way these things are reared and released. One figure that nobody can avoid is that we now release approximately 35 million pheasants into the wildlife. And that is eight times more than we did 60 years ago. However, there's also been heaps of research done over the last 60 years, and this has primarily been led by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who've been running multiple projects to find out the effects of releasing game birds on native wildlife. One of these projects is called the Allerton Project in Leicestershire, and I went there to meet with Dr. Roger Draycott to find out what they found out. Can you talk us through a brief history of the project? We were very fortunate to be bequeathed this farm here in 1992 by Lord and Lady Allerton and um, their vision was that they, they wanted to set up a demonstration project to show that you could um, farm profitably at the same time as enabling wildlife to thrive and also to demonstrate the environmental benefits that a well-run shoot can deliver. Okay. And what did the project show? What, what have the results been so far? Okay, well what we, what we did was in uh, 1992 we had a baseline year, so we undertook a lot of wildlife monitoring to assess, um, let's say for example, the numbers of songbirds on the farm and the number of hares. Uh, and then from 1993 onwards, we started a um, habitat improvement program. So we um, started to um, plant some wild bird covers. Like these in front some, of us here. Yeah, like we've got in front of us here. Some beetle banks that you might be able to see in the distance. Um, and some other habitats around the field margins and difficult to manage field corners. We started supplementary feeding. And then, uh, very importantly, we employed a gamekeeper 
to undertake predation control in the spring to control generalist predators like foxes, crows and magpies. Um, and uh, the, the key thing was we wanted to reduce the pre predation pressure on um, the birds and nesting on the farm here. And then we um, ran the farm along those lines for about 10 years. And, what and we results? saw, well, we saw a dramatic increase in the uh, songbird numbers here on the farm and also the, the numbers of wild game, both pheasants and, um, and brown hares. We wanted to show here that you could farm using modern methods, using comparable techniques to other farms in the area, but by establishing all these habitats and by undertaking the protocol, we wanted to show that if you did that, alongside the farming you could increase the wildlife resources across the farm. Yeah. We ran a very successful wild pheasant shoot here for about 10 years but then in 2001 we decided to change things because we wanted to explore which components of the system that we had here were really delivering uh, for wildlife and so we uh, took the gamekeeper away, redeployed him, put him on another project uh, but we continued to monitor all the wildlife here, we continued to feed the birds, had all the habitat in place as well. So all you took away was the pest and predator control? Yes, that's all we did. Um, and we, the wildlife started to decline. And then after a few years we started to sort of remove, the, stop the winter feeding as well. And the songbird numbers fell further. So what that indicated to us that uh, the habitat provision alone, at least on this farm, wasn't sufficient to um, you know, maintain the songbird numbers that we had at, at that time. So you, you let it go wild essentially and the wildlife declined after the remand. We took the game it. management out of the system and the wildlife declined. This perhaps isn't surprising news to uh, all of us who are involved in game management. Uh, a well-run shoot can deliver significant biodiversity benefits but it's not a given. Um, uh, running a shoot um, it doesn't guarantee you're going to have more wildlife on that shoot. You've got to work at it, you've got to do it well. So can a shoot, if they do more wildlife and habitat management, release more birds? Yes, I mean we, we've got um, sustainable releasing guidelines which are science-based so we know how many birds you can release in, in the environment without having any detrimental effects on habitats. So as long as shoots are within those guidelines, then we're comfortable that there's likely to be a, what we call a, a net biodiversity gain from that activity. Okay, so actually releasing pheasants can boost biodiversity? Absolutely, and it, it's not the pheasants themselves that's boosting the biodiversity, it's the management that's associated with releasing those birds. All shoots, if they're doing the job well, um, they are you know, clearly looking after those birds, providing them with habitat, providing them with food, um, you know, reducing predation pressure on those, on those birds. That's all good for wildlife in general. So that's if they stay within your guidelines. What if they don't? If a, a shoot can't um, follow those guidelines, then um, you know, they need to sort of question themselves, well, why can't we um, act within those guidelines? And are some of our practices uh, unsustainable? So they would, I would um, urge them to look closely um, at, at what they're doing and, and, and make sure that uh, their you know, processes and activities of running shoot are actually delivering uh, for the environment. It was clear to me that from what Roger was saying, if gamekeeping and the release of pheasants is done correctly, then the outcome is positive for nature and positive for wildlife. Things were done very differently 100 years ago, and the mainstay of shooting was wild stock, wild birds. Things have changed a lot in that last 100 years. Houses have encroached on nature, and agricultural practices have changed irreparably. I asked Ant, could we return to this era? Is wild bird shooting sustainable nowadays? I, I don't believe, personally, I've been involved with wild birds before, um, and I don't believe that it is sustainable. I think you've got to have somebody with a serious amount of money prepared to lose a lot of that money in order to have a very small harvestable surplus. You know, you, you could be looking at, if we decided to take this place wild now and stop releasing pheasants, you could be talking seven to 10 years of solid work before we could even see any sort of comeback on a, on a wild bird program to start shooting yeah. you know and that's seven years of my wages and the other guys wages who work on the estate seven years of, of continuing to put in the game crops continuing to put in everything that we do now as part and parcel of the estate which pays 
for itself in, in yeah. the release of the game birds and shooting, but that would all have to be funded with no return, with nothing at all. And I can't see personally a lot of landowners and wealthy people investing that amount of money for no comeback. You're gonna be paying a higher tax rate in order to manage land that is already quite happily managed by people who are not asking for anything back out of it other than their ability to do as they please on their land, you know, um, which is game shooting. Um, you know, and, and, and one thing I do hope that doesn't happen is if you do ban the release in, of pheasants and shoot, shooting of pheasants, that a lot of this land is unfarmable, is in arable farming, so it's not croppable. Um, so, so all this land that we have now is beautiful manicured valleys and, 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 and wild bird strips and tall grass for, for, for nesting would probably be put into intensive grazing. Yeah. So therefore it would be poached, the ground. You, talk, you know, people have said about, about game birds poaching ground. The ground would be a lot... Which can be single monoculture of grass egg, covered by sheep. Exactly. And they're going to eat all the wildflowers that manage to flower in this, in this valley in the summertime. They're going to just eat them into exist into non-existence, and, that, and that's what I hope doesn't happen. I hope that we do manage to keep what we've got here, which is a beautiful meadow, original meadow that is full of meadow grass, wild flowers, insect life. You graze that round all year. There's going to be none of that. It's going to go. A world without the benefits and variety that game shooting brings to the countryside would certainly be a different place. To illustrate Anne's point. 62,000 acres of cover crops would go. 1.25 million acres of woodlands would lose quality management. And 7,800 privately funded countryside managers, gamekeepers, would be lost. The anti-release lobby argue that wild birds are a viable alternative, and yet it is these same people that also deride the sustainable harvest that happens on grouse moors. If we remove the release of pheasants and the associated gamekeeping that comes with it, without government funding, we would see a decline in biodiversity, increased agricultural intensity, and a decline in songbirds and ground nesting birds, or just increased tax, all of which sounds and is bad. Do you think that pheasant shooting should be regulated within the confines of your recommendations? Yeah, um, well, there's very good um, uh, examples of shoots up and down the up and down Great Britain where um, self-regulation works really very well. Um, uh, of course, we need all shoots to be um, uh, self-regulating and following best practice. How do we go about encouraging shoots to do that? Yeah, well, as, as a first step, I would encourage all shoots to be familiar with the code of good shooting practice. So um, all guns on every shoot um, it should have a copy of the code of good shooting practice, read it and follow it. If everybody was complying with the code of good shooting practice, um, it, we would be in a good place. I think if regulation was to happen, the majority of estates with good welfare plans in and keepers and landowners who care about their birds are already implementing it. And I think we'd go through with flying colours. As long as it was implemented by people who know the facts and not people who like to make them up. Self-regulation as opposed to legislation. Exactly. Um, and I think that would be the only way it could be, it could be managed and worked so that everybody stays happy. Um, because I, if we over-regulate, again, it's gonna go into that quota of driving the prices up, making it you know, unaffordable for the middle to lower class. Yeah. You're gonna have the super wealthy being involved in shooting, which already happens, on different scales. The only people it will hurt is the, lower the normal class. people. Yeah. yeah, exactly, the working men and the working women that, that are involved in this spot, which is the better side of what we do, which is the side that loves it, that does it for the passion, that does it for the family and bringing the kids into it and getting out as a family to do something in the countryside, which is 100% healthy for us, you know? Um, and I just think by regulating it into non-existence would, create something that would be unsustainable. And I think on the other side of things, if we put it to say the shoots that do put millions of birds down um, and do shoot every day of the week and do overstock estates, if you give it to them, 
it would be a waste of time trying to regulate it in the first place. Um, so it's got to be done middle of the market. It's got to be done by people who know what they're talking about, who are interested in the welfare of game. Personally and as a BGA perspective, do you think regulation should happen? And if so, how so? Statutory regulation, government intervention, I genuinely believe is the worst thing for the BGA. A, it's not necessary, um, and B, it's a slippery slope. Um, and it's also an admission that we can't actually look after ourselves, and surely we all have a vested interest in the future of our sport. So it's a new thing that's come around and everyone's thinking that we need to act now, and, but we're behind the curve, we're definitely behind the curve. But if we can, and of course I'm gonna promote the BGA because <laughs> that's what the BGA is all about, self-regulation. If we can make the BGA work to the point where it, is, it encompasses 95% of the shooting um, community, and it's actually demonstrating best practice and the, the standards keep getting updated and working with other stakeholders to make sure that they are relevant, then surely that is self-regulation in practice that is doing its job. Um, aren't, aren't we always going to get judged by the 5% that aren't members though who don't stick to the good practice? But, but I mean, in everywhere, you're probably always going to get that. And whether it's in, you know, the financial world, you're going to get, you know, people, you're going to get rogues, you're going to get mavericks that will yeah. never conform. But if you can say what well, the majority of us do, and this is how we prove it because it's all independent, that is enough for the majority of people and the politicians and the people that are going to make the decisions. And I yeah. believe that's where we should be, be focusing on and making sure that we do it on our terms mm -hmm. with the input of, you know, government and the involvement of other stakeholders who have a different view of it, but working to better ourselves rather than having to being told what, being to, told do. what to do. And when, I think that's, yeah, we should, we, should, we should be working towards that. No, brilliant. Do you feel like pheasant shooting should be regulated? And if so, how so? Yeah, I don't think it would be a bad thing. Um, certainly a numbers limit wouldn't go amiss. You look at the release rates over the last 30, 40 years, numbers have increased on what's being released and return rates haven't sort of followed suit. So the return rate hasn't actually shot up massively. I know back in the day that was helped because there was a lot more wild birds and the farming practices were a lot different in the sort of early 60s, 70s compared to what they are now so it's going to be a little bit swinging it both ways but release less, improve your farming practices if possible, get more keepers on the ground to ensure these habitats are there for the natural breeding birds that we need and that will push the return rates up with a lower release rate. What is it that we're regulating against if we were to regulate pheasant release? Over density of your stocking, people cramming tons of birds into places that probably shouldn't. That and the drug side of it. I know that has come on a hell of a long way in the last three or four years, but there is more ground to be covered on that. I think even a ranger system wouldn't be a bad idea. They do a survey of your ground and assess your hedgerows, your woodlands, the state of your ground basically, in my head, and then work out some kind of magic equation that allows you to put X and that birds on your ground and you are given a license then you have to take that license to a game dealer who is only allowed to sell you x amount of birds for your ground not just of with the sort of ranger police that are going to nail you on everything but they're to help and advise at the end of the day we've got to put nature first and when we're dealing with livestock we have to treat them as number one and unfortunately there's a bit of greed out there that doesn't sort of see them as what they would be if they were a cow or a horse or anything else. Do you think we could do it all without government intervention? Yeah, I really do. Um, I really think we should encourage the change upon ourselves before it goes to Parliament. Because if we've already done it, they can't do it for us. Wild Justice's criticisms do go on and on. And it is very apparent to me that there is a right way and a wrong way of releasing game birds. And if we as a community don't self-regulate, we leave ourselves wide open to criticism and the potential of regulation. In fact, some European countries already have regulation on pheasant release. One of those is Denmark, and I spoke to my friend Tony about how it works over there. You would release birds. Okay. Um, again, you're limited to the number of birds you can release in an area. Uh, if you go over a certain number, you have to show the um, authorities a management plan that you have to develop so we're doing this type of planting here and over here to make sure that there is enough cover enough food
food. Wow. So you can't just put out. Is, is each bit of land individual or is it kind of a blanket acreage? Uh, you no, know, if you go over a certain number of birds, yeah. you will have to create a plan for your land and prove it that, that it's manageable and it's... It works? Manageable. That system works? Or? I believe it does, yeah. Uh, and I believe it's, it's given us a better reputation along the non-shooting community that we actually can prove now that we provide all this management. Does, does the management that... happens over here as well. Yeah, it's just not commonly known. Yeah, nobody wants to talk about it. Um, I'm happy to talk about it because you know, if you took away game shooting tomorrow, yeah, a lot of the planting, a lot of the wild hedgerows, a lot of the flowers, a lot of the grassy areas that you see along the cornfields and yeah. the maize fields and everything else, there are lots of strips that are voluntary only there yeah. because they benefit not just pheasants or partridge; they benefit all the land. Do you have larger scale commercial shoots? in Denmark and they just have to do more for conservation? Uh, we do, we do we do have uh, shoots that, that, that shoot a number of days a yeah. year and, and provide big days. Uh, but they can do that because they have the uh, the land to do it, mm -hmm. the topography to do it, and, and they have the management system in place. If you don't want to stand by yeah. what you do, you probably shouldn't be doing it. It looks like you're hiding something, right? The time has come to draw some conclusions. The first, after speaking to Tony, is that regulation was not the end of shooting. It was just a change. Second, that if we perhaps self-regulated, having the actual facts of exactly how many pheasants are released and how much is actually done for conservation would not hurt our cause. Thirdly, nobody wants this to get to government, so we really need to clean up our own house. And this really is a shooters voting with their feet situation. We shouldn't be funding the shoots that do not look after wildlife and look after the environment. I really have two major conclusions to give. The first is this, that it is undisputable that the release of game birds and all of the practices that go with it are beneficial for wildlife if done correctly. Secondly, through talking to people who are opposed to what we do, I've really learned that we will only ever be judged by those who do the worst job at keeping and releasing pheasants. And we, as a society, need to get together. This is not something that will be driven by one man or one organisation. And stamp out the best practice. Truly vote with your feet. Truly appreciate the nature and the environment in which you shoot. If it doesn't look like a shoot is looking after wildlife, forget about it. Do not go there. Do not endorse them. Or just demand that they do more. Because speaking to Roger, the actual effort required to increase the biodiversity and actually get that net biodiversity gain from a shoot is, is a minimal effort, really is. One final thing that inspired me is that even though Denmark have regulated release, actually it hasn't stopped them doing what they love. However, we need to be at the forefront of this and we need to be in control of any change that happens. And so finally, I urge you shoot owners, gamekeepers, those who are at the forefront of the land management to follow best practice and to try your best to reach a net biodiversity gain, to make yourselves defensible, and to make yourselves a shining example of what, as a community, we can provide to wildlife. To finish, I'll say this. We as game shooters tout the benefits to wildlife that we give. However, if we're not actually benefiting wildlife, then we're no more truthful than the opposition. Mm -hmm.